Communist Corresponding Society. The topic tonight is Blockchain Radicals on the Work of Joshua Davila, uh, and it's going to be introduced by Ian. The format of the meeting uh, will start with Ian's introductory talk. Uh, there will then be an opportunity for brief questions, like factual questions that the speaker can answer quickly. Um, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Um, at the end, I invite Ian to reply to any points that he'd like to reply to from the discussion, and we'll finish in time to be out by nine o'clock. Um, so, Ian, over to you. Thank you, Ed. So, um, the first talk I gave at the CCS was in June 2015, which is almost 10 years ago now. And that first talk was called uh, The Material Foundations of Algorithmic Socialism. And I think some of you were, in fact, there and may even remember it. Uh, so that was on the topic of, the, of emerging blockchain technology and its relevance to socialism. And the second talk I gave in November of the same year was titled uh, Venture Communism. And that was about not my proposal, someone else's proposal for an economic um, uh, commune uh, operating within and against capitalism that aimed to accumulate capital at the expense of the capitalist sector. Now, although I didn't say it at the time, no, I was thinking that those two ideas, those two talks, um, essentially go together. Uh, so why do I think that? Because it, um, I think that existing working class organisations aren't up to the task of realising socialism. So trade unions, reformists, revolutionary parties, co-ops, and so on, all very important, perhaps even necessary, but they're clearly not sufficient. And these different elements of working class power are not at all integrated into a mutually reinforcing whole. Uh, perhaps the biggest missing piece is a general lack of a revolutionary perspective uh, toward workers' savings. So the savings of the working class in the rich countries, they constitute a significant share of global capital, rivaling that of all the ultra-wealthy put together. But this enormous economic power is simply handed over to financial institutions who ultimately use it to invest in capitalist enterprises that exploit workers and reproduce the wage system. And to me, this is a, a major missed opportunity. And of those working class organizations, it's only um, the revolutionary parties that aim to consciously transcend uh, capitalism. Yet not all, but many of these parties tend to view revolution as an event where the working class rises up and takes power in a moment of capitalist crisis. But as we all know, revolution is a process and no event, however dramatic it might be, can achieve socialism unless there is a pre-existing, well-organized and well-resourced alternative to the capitalist system that can be quickly scaled up and uh, widely deployed. Uh, so I think a revolutionary event can only happen if the next society, some nascent form of international socialism, is already a mass conscious practice within capitalism itself. And that nascent form, it has to include economic production, distribution, and exchange. So that's why I talked about venture communism. And I thought that blockchain-like technologies would emerge as a key new tool for building uh, a post-capitalist system. So that was all about 10 years ago. And so this talk is simply an update. Um, I'm going to focus on the progress that's been made in using blockchain for anti-capitalist political ends. And luckily, all my work has been done for me. Uh, <laughs> because this book, um, Blockchain Radicals by Joshua Davila, uh, published in 2023, fantastic introduction to blockchain technology and what it means for the left. I recommend it if you're interested in the intersection of blockchain and, and socialism. I also recommend uh, Joshua Davila's regular podcast. It's called The Blockchain Socialist. Great way to keep up to date with this uh, area of life. So I want to share some examples. Um, I'm going to just concentrate on some of the examples that Joshua discusses in his book 
and particularly his own project, um, <coughs> the Bread Chain Cooperative, which in many ways is a seed, like an embryo, of the venture communism I was talking about 10 years ago. But even though 10 years have progressed, it's still really very, very early. And admittedly, the number of people who are involved in blockchain and socialism is very, very small, uh, but the potential, I think, is significant. And I should point out, as I think everyone knows, that cryptocurrency space is dominated by capitalist institutions and ideology, so it's stuffed full of reactionary, greedy fraudsters. But then again, so are almost all walks of life. So before I dive into those examples, I think I should briefly explain what blockchain is for those that may not know or may have forgotten or may have maybe just read what the mainstream media might report about it. So I know that many on the left still view blockchain as a, you know, a capitalist nightmare, you know, Bitcoin, speculation, scams, etc. But it isn't inherent, inherently capitalist or, or socialist. Like any tool, it serves those who wield it. So what makes it progressive or reactionary is how we choose to use it. And at its core, a blockchain is a decentralized, tamper-proof ledger. It's a way to record information securely without relying on centralized authorities like banks or governments. It's a communal database that anyone can access and contribute to, but no one actually controls. And a blockchain is maintained by running software on a network of computers. Anyone with a computer, any, any one of us here, we can run the software and become a participating node in the network. Why would anyone want to do that? Um, where you get rewarded with tokens, which have economic value, which can be spent on real goods and services. Why don't people who run the software change it so they can cheat and get more tokens? Because nodes are rewarded for running the software correctly and penalized for running it incorrectly. So the blockchain software is designed to ensure people keep running it correctly forever and ever. That's the idea. So, for example, you'd have to throw away about $50 billion to make false transactions on the Ethereum network today. And there are very few entities in the world who could possibly do that. So, the very large, successful blockchains, they're almost immutable. They're almost tamper-proof. They're very resilient against adversarial attacks. So, Bitcoin, the first blockchain, went live in 2009 as Probably everyone knows it's a ledger that records transactions of a digital currency. That's actually quite limited. Ethereum, which went live in 2015, which is the year I gave my first talk on this topic at the CCS, that has smart contract functionality. Smart contracts aren't smart and they aren't really contracts. Um, it's better to think of them as um, persistent scripts or immutable programs, programs that can't be changed once deployed. So the Ethereum blockchain not only records transactions, but it stores persistent scripts. So anyone can write applications that run on it. And Ethereum, in this sense, is the world's first global computer. All the programs that run on it run autonomously and correctly as long as the Ethereum blockchain continues to exist. So what does that mean in, in practice? It means that we have a computational commons where anyone permissionlessly, without permission, can create applications to run on this global computer. And due to the mathematics of cryptography, these applications are sufficiently secure that they can store and transfer, transfer large sums of economic value. This will, I'm convinced this will, have profound implications for the evolution of economic and social institutions in the future. And one indication of that is that in the last 10 years, uh, we've seen exponential growth in the adopt adoption of this technology. So when Ethereum went live in 2015, one Ether was worth about $1. This week, Ether is trading for about $3,000. And its total market capitalization has grown from zero to about $360 billion in 10 years. And the reason why its value has increased is because it's become the backbone of a thriving uh, decentralized economy. So right now, Ethereum, Ethereum runs about 4,000 active distributed applications, mainly, unfortunately, in the areas of decentralized finance, 
but also gaming, art, and supply chain management. And it processes roughly $1.5 trillion worth of transactions annually, and that is on the order of what Visa and MasterCard uh, do. So why is this economic activity moving on to the blockchain? Well, essentially, it's because it's, it's programmable and it's composable. Unlike traditional financial systems, which are siloed behind private corporations uh, with uh, very different kind of protocols and uh, legal friction in the way and all that kind of stuff. And it also removes the need to trust um, intermediaries, again, unlike traditional financial systems. Uh, so you don't have to rely on the banks or uh, corporations or any monopolists who might take a cut, like Visa and MasterCard, from every transaction. So a centralized server run by a corporation that can be hacked or it can be shut down or the corporation might change the rules of the game on you. But Ethereum has never stopped running in the, in the last 10 years. And its programs that it, that it runs are transparent. You can inspect them and read them and they can't change. So it's a neutral platform that anyone can build on with no gatekeepers and, no, uh, uh, with no gatekeepers and with, with hard guarantees <coughs> of security and reliability. And that's why hundreds of millions of people are storing real economic value on it and exchanging it between each other. So that's all well and good, but what's that got to do with socialism? Well, let's look at some examples in order of increasing relevance. Okay, so most internet commerce is mediated by capitalist corporations. When WikiLeaks embarrassed the US government in 2010 by exposing their crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan, major banks and payment systems such as PayPal, they blocked uh, donations to the organization. Uh, more recently, the Canadian government uh, froze the bank accounts of uh, protesters they didn't like. Uh, SciHub, uh, the website that um, gives uh, papers and books uh, for free, um, upsetting the corporate publishers. That's blocked by many ISPs and it cannot receive donations through traditional financial channels. Those are just some prominent examples. There are, of course, many, many, many more. And one of the advantages of cash that perhaps I didn't realize at the time is that it's, it is permissionless. It may be hard to get it, but once you have it, you typically don't need to ask anyone's permission on how you spend it. Uh, but cash is rapidly becoming obsolete. And with digital money, uh, powerful nation states, they can not only control value transfers at the macro and the international level, but also now at the micro and the individual level. So not only can countries and organizations be frozen out of the global financial system, but so can individual activists and dissidents too and smaller organizations. So that's a real problem. Cryptocurrency freeze value transfers from state control because anyone anywhere with an internet connection can send and receive funds without needing any permission from banks or states. So WikiLeaks asked their supporters to send the Bitcoin and that kept them going. Julian Assange has said it was the best gift the Americans could have given WikiLeaks because their Bitcoin accidentally hugely increased in value and has kept them highly solvent ever since. Uh, the Canadian protesters, they use cryptocurrencies to circumvent the government's crackdown. Sci-Hubs survives partly through cryptocurrency donations. Um, so uh, according to Western media, if it's to be, be believed, uh, North Korea, Russia and Venezuela have all used crypto to avoid US sanctions. And we're increasingly seeing uh, international crowdfunding campaigns for all kinds of causes except cryptocurrency. Uh, the banking infrastructure in Gaza has been broken down due to the onslaught of the US-backed Israeli regime, and the Palestinians have turned to cryptocurrency to receive donations from all around the world. But it's not just the politically um, oppressed who can benefit from permissionless value transfer, but anyone excluded from the financial system or forced to hold money in un unstable national currencies. So one of the biggest applications of blockchain at the moment, in terms of monetary value at least, are stable coins. 
And a stable coin is a cryptocurrency that is stably pegged to an external asset, for example, the US dollar. And the largest stable coin is USDT, which is a dollar stable coin. Over $100 billion are stored on blockchains of USDT. And these stable coins are used by millions of people all over the world, not so much in this country, but especially in Latin America, Indonesia, and Africa. So the point is this. In the last 10 years, we've seen the emergence of significant global permissionless value transfers on blockchain technology. Cash, I think, is on the way out, uh, whether we like it or not, but we do need to defend the right to freely spend our wages how we see fit, and blockchain can help with that. Some stable coins aren't to be trusted. Uh, for example, USDT is managed by a private for-profit company called Tether. They put the records of USDT on the blockchain, but the management of USDT is off the blockchain, uh, controlled by them. Tether is now one of the biggest buyers of US treasuries. It's currently ranked 19th above Germany. And so Tether helps to maintain a dollar hegemony, but it does and can freeze and confiscate um, funds at the request from the US government, it does so. So the real solution here is de fully decentralized stable coins, of which there are many. Uh, the DAI currency, D-A-I, also pegged to the dollar. That's a set of smart contracts that run autonomously with various algorithmic checks and balances to maintain that external peg. So how would you use it? Well, you take some of your fiat money, you go to a central exchange, you convert it into cryptocurrency, you lock up, you lock up, you go to the smart contract, you lock up some cryptocurrency as collateral, and then you can mint some DAI. Then you can use the DAI to make payments or lend it out or earn interest. And when you're done, you can redeem your DAI to get your collateral back and then take it out to fiat, if you so wish. So DAI is immutable. Uh, it will exist as long as the Ethereum network exists, which I expect will be a very long time. And currently there are about $5 billion of DAI in existence uh, being used every day by people around the world. So in addition to value transfers, uh, blockchains are being used to reinvent lending and borrowing by removing those financial intermediaries, uh, such as banks and payday lenders. So for example, uh, mutual credit is where anyone can create a line of credit with someone else they trust in a direct peer-to-peer uh, -peer fashion, but within a framework that de-incentivizes de the concentration of capital into few hands. So mutual credit systems aren't new. What is new is the ability to automate them on a global scale. So an example would be a, a project called Trust Lines. It was an early example. Not a company, a set of smart contracts. You can make loans in terms of stable coins, uh, choose from hundreds of different national currencies, the pound, the dollar, whatever. Or you can have credit in terms of hours. So it supported time banking, uh, any community currencies you wanted to create yourself, it could be in terms of beers you owe your friend, or in-kind favours like tidying or gardening, uh, you get the idea. You don't need any government ID or bank account to start, you just need another friend on the network to connect with and create a trust line. And then you choose what you want to lend, to lend and borrow and um, create a mutual credit limit. So trust lines didn't actually take off. Um, it failed and it's now defunct. It lasts for about two years. But we have to expect lots of failures when, we, when people start experimenting with these things. Another example is Circle's UBI. UBI for Universal Basic Income. Again, a set of smart contracts with a community of humans uh, who use it. It's a currency, it's a mutual credit system, with this twist, which is the community gives itself a universal basic income. So if you participate in this system, you are issued with one token, it's called circle token, doesn't matter, one token every hour. Every hour you get a token for participating. Each token loses its value at a rate of 7% per year. So that discourages hoarding and encourages spending. 
and uh, the token can be spent anywhere where it's, where it's accepted. Um, unfortunately, not many places accept it yet. <laughs> there's some place, I think there's a co-op in Berlin and a few cafes and things like that, as you might expect. Not quite Marx's labor tokens, but not that dissimilar either. Okay, so we've covered uh, value transfers uh, and mutual credit, but in some respects money is, the, is, is simple compared to the kinds of uh, deliberative decision-making required to run uh, a society. So simply having uh, permissionless transnational representations of value isn't enough. Uh, we need to build worker-owned and democratically controlled uh, political institutions that can manage that value in a way that's democratic, transparent, and fair. And there's many, many experiments of decentralized self-governance on the blockchain at the moment. I just mentioned one uh, highlighted in Joshua's book because it's, it's quite ambitious and it's also quite surprising, I think. It's uh, called Project Kleros or Kleros, and it's a decentralized arbitration system. It's kind of decentralized court system. So imagine you're a freelancer in one country working for a client in another country. You make an agreement, but a dispute arises over the payment. Uh, now, contractual disputes, especially across national boundaries, can be incredibly expensive and time consuming to resolve. Kleros is an alternative to this. It runs on Ethereum. It's a hybrid system of smart contracts and some traditional web infrastructure um, that enables crowdsourced jurors incentivized by game theory to deliver fair judgments. So you're a contractor. You've not been paid. You submit your dispute and the contract has been um, no, that's not true. It doesn't have to be. The contract does not have to be part of the Kleros system as long as there's a contract that can be looked at by human beings. So you submit your dispute to Kleros, you pay an arbitration fee, and a randomly selected jury will review the evidence and make a decision. And anyone can become a juror. Anyone in this room could become a juror if they wished. All you need to do to become a juror is stake some money for which in return you receive these Kleros tokens. The jurors assess evidence and commit their votes. The votes remain hidden until everyone has voted. The jurors who vote with a winning majority receive a share of the arbitration fees and a share of the minority jurors who weren't in the majority, a share of their state money. And that's there's more to it than that in terms of game theory, but the protocol designed to try and encourage truthful and accurate judgments and defend against bribery and collusion amongst the jurors. And if you're dissatisfied with the outcome of the appeal, you can trigger a new round by paying more money, new jurors are selected, but the appeal fees increase exponentially to discourage um, frivolous um, complaints. And all the token holders of the Kleros token uh, participate in a liquid voting system to modify the parameters, the policies, establish new subcourts for particular domains of expertise, and even update the platform's code. So, people are using Kleros right now to resolve disputes over things like escrow accounts, um, microtasking jobs across the internet, insurance, content moderation. So I looked, today uh, there are $177 million of value locked in Kleros and there's 697 active jurors. So if you want to make some money, got a spare few hours, you can become a juror on Kleros and make decisions on things. Okay, so there are lots of, now uh, in the last 10 years, the people have, it's the software, so you expect this, there are lots of open source software primitives for building decentralized autonomous organizations, you know, um, organizations that run mainly in terms of a set of smart contracts on the blockchain. There's lots of off-the-shelf solutions you can just use for yourself for creating and managing DAOs, as they're called, including voting on proposals, membership, and, and treasury management. So, uh, Joshua Davila's Breadchain Cooperative. That's a good example of a DAO but one that's explicitly aligned with socialist principles. So Joshua's Bread Chain Cooperative advocates for building alternative anti-capitalist institutions. Um, 
everything has to start somewhere. <clears throat> and one of the most important things is to build a community that can democratically manage its own resources. And BreadChain has a community cryptocurrency called Bread, and that's pegged to the DAI stablecoin that I mentioned before. So Bread is essentially pegged to the US dollar. You join by baking bread, that is you, you put some DAI as collateral into the BreadChain cooperative, and you get some bread tokens in return, which are pegged to the dollar. You can get your money back any time by burning that bread, and then you receive the die that you originally added as collateral in back. So you're not locked in. It's basically like a savings account. So your die is then automatically invested in yield generating protocols. If you're interested about what that actually means, happy to answer later. But it, it earns interest. And all this interest is collectively owned by the members of the co op. The bread holders participate in a 30-day voting cycle to allocate a fraction of that interest to fund projects that they care about. The deliberation process is off-chain in a, I think it's a Discord forum, right? So why would anyone want to get involved? Well, you could take some of your savings accounts, if you have them, uh, some money you might have got saved up in British pounds. You could convert it to bread. Your savings will then earn interest like they would in a bank, but you forego a fraction of your interest to get a say in deciding how a fraction of the collective interest is spent on projects that you care about. So it's a good example of how to pool capital bottom up and then democratically allocate it to projects that could further political goals. And the projects that the Breadchain Cooperative currently funds is uh, the Crypto Commons Association, you organize events on blockchain and the commons and something called Labor DAO, which is a small think tank tank examining how blockchain can further workers' rights. So right now, um, $331,000 of value is locked in, in, in bread chain and it earns 7.5% interest annually, which is better than the bank will give you. And about 30 people are actively participating in the governance of this co-op uh, distributed all over the world. And how do I know that? Because everything is transparent and on-chain. So you just take a look. The, the books are open, so to speak. So there are lots of more examples. I can't cover them all. But I think it's, it's very exciting and interesting to see uh, many of the anti-capitalist experiments that Joshua uh, discusses in his book. But it is still very early and it's very embryonic. Uh, the underlying blockchain technology is still evolving. The new advances in the last 10 years in cryptography mean that this idea of a computational commons able to run all of the world's economic activity. Actually, that 10 years ago was a bit of a pipe dream because the Ethereum blockchain was so incredibly slow. But with advances in cryptography and various other things, it's becoming an actual distinct reality. So what is, if you take a step back, what's really happening here? We're beginning to objectify our social relations in kind of new, harder forms of, of mathematics and computer code. We've always objectified our social relations in, in, in code, in, in written law, and in institutions and all that kind of stuff. But now it's being objectified in a new form, mathematics and computer code. And the question then is, what social relations do we want to encode and participate mm -hmm. in? Because the infrastructure of those fut of the future is really being built now, and we're at the beginning of a kind of Cambrian explosion of um, distributed applications. So I think there's a real opportunity for socialists. Uh, the opportunity, the the vision, is to build global, decentralised working class institutions that are much less corruptible, and much more automated, and much more scalable than we have today by utilizing these new tools. But that can only happen if we engage critically with the technology and not dismiss it out of hand. And at the very least, um, revolutionary parties, uh, trade unions, co-ops, any other kind of working class organizations that rely on the traditional banking system and therefore can be uh, easily and swiftly debanked and financially blockaded any time by the whim of a bourgeois politician, they should be looking at how to use blockchains to protect themselves from state repression. 
So blockchain isn't inherently capitalist or socialist as a tool. Like any tool, it depends. Its impact depends on how it gets used and for what purpose. This book is a great entry point for anyone interested in new tools for building and hardening uh, socialist institutions. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. If anybody has factual questions or questions that Ian can answer in a sentence, then ask them now. Uh, Mike, then Z. Yeah, can you just spell die, teba, or tether, or whatever it is, kleros? <laughs> die is D A I, tether is T E T H E R, tether of okay. sus, and. Um, what was that Kleros. Kleros is K L E R O S. Thanks. Thanks. Zed. Uh, yeah, maybe a stupid question, but what happens if um, somebody who's got uh, who, who's involved in um, in a, a, who has an account or whatever the terminology is with one of these things, if they I don't know, if they lose access to computing facilities or if they, uh, well, if they die, what happens to the, what, what happens to the accumulated uh, exchange value, I suppose you call it, or what, whatever resources that they have yeah. on the system? So the account on a blockchain is a bit like a, um, a safety deposit box in a bank and you have keys for it. Mm. You can have one key for it, you can make copies of keys, or you can have multiple keys, so three people have got to turn it at the same time to open it, analogously. They're not real physical keys. And um, if, if you die, and you don't tell anyone where the key is, you can't open the safety deposit box, but the money's still in there. If you die and pass your key on to someone else, they'll inherit it. Or if it's multiple keys, a multi-signature wallet is one where um, N of M keys are enough to open it. So this is done for um, when collectives need to have multiple keys. Like there's 10 keys in a collection of 100 people and s s six out of 10, 10 keys are enough to open the deposit box. Yes. I have a kind of poking question. Um, and how does BridgeDAO deal with 50% attacks? And does it consider those to be attacks or simply a form of democracy? Like what if 50% of the people decided to invest in something stupid? Um, okay, so I thought by um, by 51% 50, attacks, I thought you were talking about um, attacks on the, on the blockchain infrastructure in itself, right? Um, but no, it's a slightly different question. You're asking how, what to prevent say, Red Chain Cooperative from being um, taken over by people who love libertarianism and gold, say. And um, I think, um, there's, as far as I know, there's nothing intrinsic to the actual um, architecture of the system to prevent that. It would be like a political party or something that could be overtaken by other people. I don't think there's anything to stop that from a concerted effort now. Any other questions? Uh, if not, we will move into general discussion. Any points anybody would like to make? A number of these are sort of questions. That's okay. They're sort of halfway questions, halfway. Um, the point about losing access. Yeah. What? Uh, what? What the Iranian regime did when? Uh, people started using social media extensively to mobilise was just shut the hardware down. The what down, sorry? Hardware. Just shut the hardware down altogether. Uh, and it seems to me that this is vulnerable to the same thing. It relies on the assumption, it's number one, it, it relies on the assumption that the, the hardware on which the net runs will still run, which continues to run, is um, uh, 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 <clears throat> physically shut down. Um, second, um, was it you or was it 
Paul DeMarty made the point. Uh, cryptography. Um, uh, I've got a, the, the crypto libertarian says I've got a really great piece of uh, cryptography on my machine. The Secret Service can't get into it. Yeah. And um, uh, the Secret Service guy said, no problem, we'll just hit him with a spanner until uh, he uh, tells us the password. Um, <coughs> which is, in a sense, the same issue as the issue of that 51%. Um, or that the Conservative Party is in process of being taken over by the Farishists. Um, okay, that's not, that's not really a foreign takeover because... Um, The, 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 the cradle of the British far right was the League of Empire Loyalists, which was a faction within the Conservative Party. And so the, for the far right to reverse takeover the Conservative Party is not a novelty. It's, a, it's an extreme right party in the first place. But there is that sense of um, that, yeah, the, there is humans of the sort of <laughs> weak link. Uh, in this stuff. The other thing was it, which is um, and, uh, the, in relation to the hardware again the um, uh, carbon emissions costs um, very substantial carbon emissions costs of uh, Bitcoin mining I don't know whether this is true of the other blockchain types of operations. I'm sort of, uh, there's a real concern about that. Um, smart contracts and um, arbitration operations, Clairos and so on and so forth, all of this depends on the willingness of the adverse party to cooperate. Yeah. And, What's different about a judicial system as opposed to a cooperative arbitration, an agreed arbitration system, is that if the judge rules against you, then uh, the bailiffs will come, and you don't comply, the bailiffs will come. And if you well, use sufficient force to f keep off the bailiffs, then the cops will come. And if you use sufficient force to keep off the cops, then police marksmen will come. And if you use sufficient force to keep off the police marksmen, then the army will show up. Uh, okay, in America, it's more militarized police like the FBI at um, uh, uh, Waco, Texas, or the with artillery, or the um, uh, uh, this is we don't see that much of it because it's uh, it, it's below the surface. It's um, I see it in my legal history work, in the sort of the guys, um, the, the chancellor makes an order, and says, Sheriff, arrest this guy for contempt of the chancery order. And the sheriff writes back and says, um, send a sergeant to arms. Uh, and then one of the ones in the 17th century, send, him, send some artillery, please, because the guy's fought it up, and we need artillery to get him out of the... You know, property um, or in 13th century law uh, if, the, if, the, if the defendant wrongfully drives cattle into a castle the sheriff is to uh, demand that he hand them over and if he won't hand them over the sheriff is to raise the posse comitatus uh, and if he can't get into the castle with the posse comitatus then the statute says the next time a king is in the area with an army, he will demolish the castle. Um, okay, the, the, my point is we don't see that because compliance is normal in the UK. Yeah. It's more normal in the UK than it is in the US. Um, and the, uh, actually it's more normal in the UK than it is in some, other, some, other, some continental jurisdictions and certainly many third world jurisdictions. But the... Uh, underlying structure of coercion with death at the end of it uh, is actually inherent in the, the, is inherent the difference between a judicial system and contractual arbitration and contractual arbitration at the end of the day 
it's the contract of arbitration which is enforced by the judicial system by these usual bleeding methods. Um, so I'm sort of... Um, uh, I think there's probably a lot of possibilities in this stuff, but I, in, on the one hand, I think that if uh, it gets seriously in the way of the US government's um, uh, uh, financial blocking operation, and its sworn allies' financial blocking operations, the US government will just take it down by using whatever military force is necessary to take it down. Um, uh, uh, a, and B, on the other hand, that actually uh, you need the real world, you need to think about the real world consequences of default, which I would guess is what took down, you said, um, Trust, trust lines. Trust lines fails. You need to you need to calculate in um, so much in the way of bad debt um, uh, as part of the uh, general overheads and running costs. But equally, um, oh dear, the uh, money. Yet, Dira Gonzalez de Lara on the secret of Venetian success. Money works as money at the end of the, state money works as money at the end of the day because the state discriminates against non local actors. Yeah, because state money at the end of the day, there is not enough gold, copper, and silver, gold, silver, and copper for the transactions needs of the. Roman Imperium or the late medieval economy in the world so that you need credit money of some sort and this is just a different form of credit money at the end of the day um, but credit money functions um, because just leaving the jurisdiction to, to escape your creditors fails because the state uh, discriminates against non-local actors um, so that it's it's the mm, uh, mercantilist character of the capitalist state which enables credit money to function. Without the that mercantilist character, the credit money fails. But that's a that's another issue. That, that's sort of uh, it, it's a it, it's a question about how large this can get without falling down because of its problem default problems. Anybody else? Yes. <clears throat> I was just going to ask, um, just following on from you, how does the state discriminate against non-local actors? Can you give like a, just a brief example? Like, would it be like protectionism? Yeah, yeah. 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 Anybody else? Not, not necessarily in the form of tariff protectionism, but uh, regulatory non-tariff barriers of one sort or another. Have a question or on, on um, a, another source of vulnerability, which is um, the seems. I'll just give, give by way of example. When I was like 16, I bought some Bitcoin and I took it off the exchange that I bought it on and have it stored in a wallet. Uh, but if I wanted to exchange that for fiat, I'd have to put that back on the exchange. Now that the exchange is all regulated, um, you know, hit, hit I could sell it would be no problem, I'd pay a little bit of tax on it or whatever. But if the exchange the exchanges have an address, so if regulators that the exchanges operate with within um, you know, do something, then the regulators can underline the existence of the exchanges. And while something like the um, red coin or whatever it was called uh, could be used to fund things within the system that Redcon uh, is used within. People want to exchange with fear to buy other commodities that don't exist on that chain, then there is a vulnerability of that interface. Um, yeah, so Mary, if you have any thoughts on how to escape that particular tension. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. I kind of have a point about um, DAOs, which is kind of DAOs. Um, I'm quite interested.
interest in the idea of um, having a more structured organizational form. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you kind of counterposed uh, like the traditional political parties, trade unions, movements, um, with their role in the left as being these things which organize people together to do things, like the kind of organizational um, machines. Um, and you know, if you go to a party congress, there's committees, there's um, a whole kind of series of rules and regulations and means by which motions get voted on. There's like a, a whole democratic process, um, which all bubbles up from uh, about 100 years of people sort of having meetings and, and trying to work out how to direct an organization. Um, and then you have the internet which comes along, and now you have people organizing in Discord forums. Um, and I feel like at one, at, on one side it's a step backwards because we've lost a lot of the, you know, the accumulated knowledge of how to like run a meeting and how to take minutes and you know, be good trading with bureaucrats. And then on the other hand, um, I think that the blockchain in, in a kind of, the kind of very deliberative processes which come from DAOs write into things rules which I think we on the left could probably follow. Like we could learn from having um, uh, voting processes which are um, online and verifiable and not just kind of you know, hands in the ring kind of thing. Um, and also being able to make decisions in such a way that are accountable and that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm kind of interested in it from the perspective of cryptographic technologies being used to um, make us more effectively organized. Um, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, just some vague ideas. Um, Historically, um, something like the SPD in Germany was like states within the states prior to uh, the late 19th, early uh, 20th century, and the way in which they organized and whether you know, that dual state idea um, could be facilitated by something like a cryptocurrency. And the point there that if organizations and social relations, how would they be coded with algorithms? How I, I, I'm not a mathematician or know anything about algorithms, but the way in which algorithms are constructed and coded, how, is it possible for forms of social organization to be embedded in code and resistant to other pernicious forms? Um, and, and so, uh, in response to Mike, where if you do organize in such a way, how fun it will be vulnerable to state repression? Uh, how far can you organize within the state, separate from the state? And if there's a cryptocurrency, say for socialist movement, labor movement, how would that link with existing currencies, so the US dollar or the British pound or whichever state it was operated in? But I think, um, you know, it could be organized internationally. And also, this de the decentralization and computational commons that gives possibilities for working within states, but for like within where the state. That might sound a bit utopian, but yeah. Anybody else? Zach? <coughs> yeah, um, yeah, well, thanks very much, Ian. I, uh, a, a lot to think about there. What, what struck me is, um, is that maybe this undermines something which I've kind of often thought, which I've kind of taken as uh, quite axiomatic for quite a long time, 
which is that the transition from capitalism to socialism has to come in a come about in a quite different way from previous transitions from one mode of production to another, in the sense that um, when a, you know when a, when feudalism um, gave way to capitalism, or the you know as a process, it wasn't an event as you uh, as you say. So it's a process, but it didn't have to be the case the bands of capitalists or groups, organisations of capitalists had to consciously organise themselves in order to overthrow a previous mode of production and establish a new one. You could just, um, you know, you don't have to organise capitalism, it's just something that once it gets a hold, it's, um, you can set up little islands of capitalism within a feudalist within a feudalist um, world and they grow because of the superiority of the mode of production uh, and I've always thought you can't really you, you can't really do that in a transition from capitalism to socialism because you can't set up little islands of socialism when the whole point about socialism is to collectively organize the uh, the the, the bulk of the productive forces within society. That's not you can, that's not something that you can do, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there, um, with a small group of people and the, and just expect it to expect it to kind of expand just because because of the superiority or the greater efficiency uh, uh, of that mode of organisation. It's um, so so socialism. So, bringing about socialism is fundamentally different in the sense that does, it has got to be a, a conscious process, whereas capitalism, bringing about capitalism, didn't have to be conscious in that sense. Now, it seems to me that the kind of ideas that you put forward um, may shake up that view of mine, and that maybe it is possible to I mean, I take I, I take the point that um, the, the the points that Mike uh, raised about that ultimately it's not as permissionless as it sounds because you can always deny uh, permission with a bit of brute force or a lot of brute force, but um, but yeah, no, I mean, I just wanted to say this kind of uh, made me rethink some of the ideas that I've had already about, that, that I used to have about it not being possible to set up um, small um, small clusters of socialism in a social, in a capitalist world and expect it to just naturally, expect it to just naturally grow. Okay, uh, Mike, then me. Yeah, I, I must admit, I think that Zed's position on the question of the transition from capitalism to feudalism to capitalism is wrong, you know, because <coughs> if we look at the small clusters of capitalists, capitalism in the Italian city-states or in the city-states of the Rhineland, you know, uh, they're conquered by the uh, surrounding feudalism in very much so very similar ways to the ways in which uh, the Soviet Union and its other things are conquered by surrounding capitalism. They're, acculturated to capitalism and in <coughs> the states of the Rhineland the, 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 the state in the shape of the um, Holy Roman Empire uh, intervenes against and again in France actually the, 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 uh, the, the, the French absolutist state intervenes to suppress the British state the, the Tudor and Stuart state intervenes to suppress the autonomy of cities and bring them within the um, uh, social order. So then the Netherlands makes a revolution, but the immediate result of the Netherlands revolution is a war which spreads, stretches from Taiwan to Brazil, in a world war. And exactly the same is true of 1688 in Britain. Immediately the result of 1688 is a world war which is fought in India, is fought in North America, is fought in uh, the uh, Pacific. Um, <clears throat> it isn't the case. It's, if it, capitalism becomes the point at which we get 
the business cycle regularises is the moment of the decisive British victory over France and the Peace of Paris in 1763. And at that point, we start getting the regular return of uh, the business cycle because it's coercive. Capitalism is, co is not insistent. It, it's more efficient, but it's more efficient because it's more coercively efficient than feudalism. And it can't, doesn't, without the guys going to a new conception of the state, uh, which is step one, in, well, it's step one in the, the, the in Venice and Genoa, step two in the Netherlands, step three in Britain, and then everything else is imitations of the British state. Um, <coughs> so I, I'm sort of, you know, I, I think we can do, I, I, I think the, certainly the case is possible to do cooperatives of one sort or another, and it may well be the case that Ian's point that these blockchain techniques may be really useful to cooperative decision making. I'm not quite so clear about how that works. I say I don't think it makes it immune from the state, but nonetheless, uh, at the end of the day, um, you, you can do um, some degree of autonomy from the ruling regime. You can build up it's not like Luxembourg who argues you can't build socialism within capitalism, unlike that the working class can't <coughs> build its own institutions within capitalism, unlike the um, capitalist it's a, And I'm not even sure she meant it. It's just a casual remark in a SPD Congress, which was in an argument which was then picked up on and amplified by new left writers in the 50s and 60s. Um, I don't think it's true. It's clear that trade unions and co-ops and mutuals and stuff, we are talking about working class institutions organised within and subject to the capitalist regime. But the capitalist regime intervenes within them to force them into the direction of um, bribe-taking politicians, as in the Labour Party, or um, profit-oriented operations like the co-op or the mutuals. Uh, oh, that's a, so in that sense, I, I, know, I, <coughs> I think it's a wrong way to think about it to say that because socialism is... Co the, the cap I don't think the transition to capitalism is an unconscious transition. Yeah, yeah thank you. I'll say a couple of things. Um, uh, probably uh, thinking of just on what Mike said, scope for a a history of anti-communism that would include feudal opposition to the communes when they were capitalist towns. Um, but a anyhow, I mean, certainly, thank you very much, Ian, for the for the introduction. Um, there's a lot there to think about, and I think the the point that you almost started with about lots of workers' savings that is being used to prop up the existing order. I think that's a very that's a very significant point and that's something that that no part of the of the labor movement that I'm aware of does take seriously or does try to do anything about. Um, so I think there's certainly on on that on savings accounts, on pension funds, um, uh, and if you've got your savings in the bank and your pension and the pension fund and so on, and you know that's invested in the stock market. It spreads um, anti-socialist thinking among the working class because you think what's good for the stock exchange is what's good for me. And that's not pure ideology because your pension is in it. So what's good for the stock market is, in some sense, good for you. Uh, so all, all of that, I think, is, is, is really important. Um, Blockchain as a, a tool that is not intrinsically capitalist or socialist and can be used for any purpose. It sounds as though it's the sort of thing that's likely to be true because tools generally are like that. Um, 
we don't imagine that a socialist society would stop using railway locomotives because they were, they were an invention of capitalism. Um, but still, most of the examples that the talk included of uses of blockchain did sort of sound like cash the only nexus between man and man, although that might not be notes and coin, but it sounded a lot like you put your money in, you put up your collateral, you get your interest. Um, and the only one that wasn't purely about that was the trust lines where you can uh, pledge to weed the neighbour's garden. And I'm not quite clear with, with that how the blockchain knows whether I did it or not. If I say, yeah, I definitely, I definitely weeded, what are you talking about? Uh, and the neighbour says, no, you bloody didn't, look. Then I'm not sure how that, you know, something that is out there in the real world and not measurable in tokens, I'm not sure how it gets resolved. The arbitration system, I mean, I do do freelance work for clients who are overseas, and sometimes they don't pay me. Um, generally they do um, because generally they they intend to employ a translator again or a proofreader again or whatever I'm doing for them but they don't always pay and realistically there isn't a great deal you can do about it because the sums involved are not large enough to take them to to court which if they're based in Minsk would be uh, expensive um, <coughs> I don't do sanctioned busting um, but I don't think I don't think the dodgy sort of client would agree to any non-dodgy arbitration. And if they did agree to go through the arbitration process, I can't then compel them to pay. You know, I can just I can point them to the thing that says, "Look, you ought to pay the money." Well, I could point them to something that said they ought to pay the money before. Um, <clears throat> so I I wouldn't expect. I wouldn't expect to reclaim any bad debts through that. Um, I'm also, I'm not sure that I, and this is purely a detail, I'm not sure that I like the idea that you incentivise good performance by jurors by getting them to vote with the majority. That you win, if you, if you vote in the winning side, then you get the reward. Um, because you know, we've all maybe seen the film Twelve Angry Men. Um, he didn't start out in the majority, but he could very easily go, I see where the majority is. Bish bash bosh, I'll vote with the majority. And even if even if you couldn't see the votes, even if you couldn't see which is taking away something from a jury if you can't discuss it and deliberate and do a straw poll. Um, <clears throat> but you could see, well I know the way this is gonna go. And although I myself might think actually that um, the, the plaintiff is right and those crooks ought to pay their translations. If I can see that that's not... You know, I, I've been doing this for ages. I know that it never votes that way. Um, you could even, with the same quite small pool, you mentioned the number in the hundreds of jurors, um, you could get a situation where they do all know, well, it, al it always votes, votes that way in cases like this. And maybe nobody that nobody involved actually agrees with that, but they all expect that's how all the others will vote. Um, and one of the reasons why sortition is better than opinion polling, when they both use a sample, is that opinion po polling people might be trying to guess, guess how other people might do or something. Um, people on a jury are not trying to guess guess how other people are trying to come up with their own mind. Anyway, that's a detail I don't want to focus too much about, too much on that. Um, I mean, I think the, the issue that you raised, you know, say the bread chain does really well and it pays better interest than anything else you can do with your money. Well, why wouldn't people who oppose its politics put their money in um, and then quite naturally vote for it to do reactionary things if it's just a sensible investment. If it, you know, most. What the Tories did to the building society movement. Yeah. Um, and if it works as an investment, 
you know, there's, we're being asked to support it in two incommensurable ways. One of them is an, is an investment that pays interest, and the other is a political project that does things I support. And why shouldn't somebody join it for the cash in hand and then not support not support the same politics as, as me? At the moment, that's unlikely because, from what you said, it's a small project. Um, so at the moment, it, it's, it's a few people. But if it took off, then I think that would become, that would become a problem. Um, how does it expel deviationist tendencies? Um, what kind of left group is it if it can't even, can't even do that? Um, and I think people are, aren't likely. You talk about how much money it would involve to uh, crash the whole of Ethereum. Presumably to bust up some particular sub-organisation on it would not involve such huge resources. People mostly don't do it because when there isn't a political dimension, if I'm investing in a cryptocurrency, then I sort of have an interest in common with all the other people on it, and we all agree what, that having two Bitcoin is better than having one, and Bitcoin being worth a lot in, against fiat and against other tokens is better than it being worth a little. Um, and we can all agree what the units of measurement are and so on. Whereas if you want the bread token to do well and pay high interest, and I want to uh, do Hasbara for the State of Israel, then we haven't got a we haven't got a unit of measurement. And I might easily think, well, I'll make a financial loss. You know, I'll make a financial loss in smashing up this irritating project. But that's fine. I make a financial loss with most of the political things that I engage in. I'm not doing it directly directly for that. Um, so, sorry, that, that, all sound, that all sounds quite, quite negative, and I did find it a very thought-provoking talk. And I think the question about, um, you know, stick it, stick it in bread. I mean, it, compared to existing pension funds, is, you know, although, although I'm not wholly convinced that I'm not wholly convinced that the answer is the answer, but I'm very convinced that the question is the question and the, about what we do with workers' savings and so on. That, I think, is really important. The existing de facto answer, which is let the bourgeoisie run it for us, that, I think, is a terrible answer. I'm not convinced that put it on, on the blockchain is the right answer, but... I'm also, not, it would have to work hard to be worse than what we're doing at the moment. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, just, yeah, just a quick one. Um, just, I think Mike touched on it earlier about sort of the energy required to keep these sort of systems going and operating. Um, has there ever been like a, a calculation that if these things were scaled up? Uh, massively, how how much like energy these sort of systems actually require? Just remind me of a quote by Lenin when he said, um, "Communism is electric electrification plus solar power." Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just chairing while that's uh, nipping off the toilet. Anybody else? Yep. Uh, see, I think seeing social, you know, moving on beyond the wage system. Uh, where labour is a commodity. Um, I've noted that I need to brush up on Capital Volume 1 in the circuit, the commodity money, commodity circuit. And the <clears throat> to move beyond commodified labour, how can money is essentially a medium of exchange and blockchain is a um, tool like, like that. How would... So moving beyond the wage system facilitated by a monetary mechanism. Is, is that just 
Yeah. Um, going back on the thing about commodity exchange, um, uh, I don't know if you remember way back in 2014, there was a cafe on St. Margaret's uh, Road called Jim Bob's Cafe. Uh, they uh, allow you to buy things in Bitcoin, so you can buy like coffee with Bitcoin. Uh, your example of, of a cafe in Berlin that allows you to buy things in, in Jai coin. <coughs> um, <coughs> these things didn't exist, or maybe they still exist in Berlin. I know that there was a moment in around about 2014, 2015, 2016 when there were, um, you, could, you had Bitcoin ATMs in some shops. Um, you could uh, buy, for example, games on Steam, the game platform using Bitcoin. Um, there was, you couldn't you know, go into your daily shopping with Bitcoin, but you, you could to some extent engage in some degree of like, trading goods and services with this, with this stuff. Um, and then the banks went and ruined it all by investing in it and making it a kind of completely, a purely financial thing. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the real world examples of being able to use this stuff all disappeared um, because nobody wanted to touch something that was financially volatile or um, it's too big as well, you know. How much? How much is one Bitcoin worth? Tens of thousands. Uh, I think you said it's all time high uh, today. Yeah, it's nearly a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, it's like having a gold coin in the Middle Ages, and um, it's too bleeding expensive. It's like. Uh, um, uh, two years' wages for a skilled worker. Uh, you can't use it for anything other than large-scale payments. <laughs> and in that sense, yeah, it's a sort of how do you keep the financial system out? Sorry, I'm interrupting. Well, I think it's a, a good point about things like transaction fees. So transaction fees have gone up. Um, I know Ethereum has proof of stake now. They've, they've changed it so they don't have to do that, but Nonetheless, I think that the, the moment there was like a, a brief window where we, we did have cryptocurrency as money that could be properly used as an exchange, a thing for exchanging goods and services. Um, and I feel like that moment is now past. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, hand the chair back to Ed. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, in a in a minute, I'm going to ask Ian to reply to any points that he'd like to. If anybody would like to chip in any last thoughts, but quickly, then uh, then you can. Um, uh, if not, we'll be back here again next week, maybe in this room or maybe in another room in the building. Um, but same time, seven thirty. The topic then will be a loom for algebra, the analytical engine. Um, so it might continue some of the uh, issues that have come up today. Um, I think that's it for parish business. So, uh, Ian, don't feel obliged to reply to everything, but anything that you'd like to reply to, uh, you can. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that was a really good discussion, lots of great questions and thoughts uh, and opinions. Thank you very much. Uh, the easy ones first. Bitcoin is still on a uh, proof of work system which is highly energy inefficient. It's it's a disgusting amount of energy is wasted for Bitcoin. Um, other systems have moved off that into a proof of stake that was mentioned. It's a completely different approach, and its energy requirements are uh, insignificant compared to Bitcoin. So that's not not an issue. It's an issue for Bitcoin. Bitcoin has failed as a payment system. It's failed as money. Um, it's been taken over culturally as um, by hard money, uh, gold bugs kind of people, and um, it's been marketed by the holders of Bitcoin as digital gold. Um, I think that's ultimately a very limited use case and not at all interesting. Um, cryptocurrency as payments hasn't really manifested, partly because I think Bitcoin um, fumbled it, but also. Even today, the user experience is not quite as slick as using your credit card or your, it's, and local infrastructures is not there. 
but there is a lot of um, transfer of value in stable coins all over the world. Um, to what extent it's actually accepted by local vendors, I'm not sure of the case in Latin America or in East Asia, but it is still limited in terms of the, as a, a payment system locally on the ground, for sure, um, as we got there. Um, there was a bunch of questions around uh, Kleros and trust lines about um, how they could be broken. Uh, and bread chain too. Um, so I thought, Mike, that you'd find a flaw in Kleros because of your expertise. I was I was expecting that. I didn't I didn't think about that at all. And um, here I can't do justice to these projects because I'm not. I don't know them well enough to defend them from or, or answer the questions that you've raised about them. And I suspect that the people who have designed them um, would have something to say about that, and I, I don't really. Um, I absolutely agree that um, laws have to be enforced by force at the end of the day. Um, I wonder if Claros uh, gets parties to maybe stake some insurance and in escrow account between them. So maybe the translators of the world could get together and say, you know, only if it's a Claros contract are we going to work for you, and any any particular company that violates the contract will never work with you again. I don't think Claros can solve those particular problems. And the same with trust lines. Um, when you set up a trust line, you agree with a mutual credit, so that there's a limit to the credit you can um, agree with each other. And if someone defaults, then you just cut them off from that trust line. It's like a social network, right? And so... Um, Bad actors, they can maybe do it once or twice, but eventually they'll lose their friends, lose the actual links, the trust lines between them, and not engage in the network. So um, a lot of these things, uh, as soon as you start thinking about them, you start thinking about what's called mechanism design, and how to integrate humans with rules that are encoded where the interface is through operations of exchange of information with the blockchain. And it's actually really interesting, rich and active area about designing these kind of hybrid institutions which are robust to adversaries. And um, the most mature example of that, so you, I, I, again, I couldn't speak about Red Chain Co-op about uh, adversarial attacks. I imagine it's the same, they don't have anything in place yet to prevent that, other than their culture other than their, political, their, group, their collected political ideas. I don't think they have any actual hard mechanism on the blockchain to enforce that the uh, collective pool of interests has to be invested in uh, co-ops and therefore uh, no exploitative relations could possibly... You know, I don't think they have that in force. It's purely um, in their, their wishes at the moment. It's not as hard as in that sense. Could it be in the future? Yeah, maybe it could be encoded on, on the blockchain uh, to that extent. Um, there was an extra point there that I then have forgotten, no matter. Um, the other thing is, Zed, you said that the transition to uh, socialism and communism has to be conscious. That, that's, that's the line. I, I think I actually it has to be. I, you know, nothing can happen without actually having a goal and ideas about what you want to achieve. It can't happen unconsciously. Um, but I wonder if... I hesitate to, to like generalize to such an extent, but I wonder if the revolutionary left has relied a bit too much on consciousness alone in the sense of, um, you know, if we all agree that this is a good idea, it will somehow magically happen, and, and neglected to some <laughs> extent uh, material incentives that actually give people reasons to engage now, and by doing so it will materially be advantageous to their lives immediately. Um, and... Um, you said that capitalism was coercively efficient. Um, 
yes, there's a lot of actual violence, of course, but there's also lots of sort of material incentives that were coercive in a sense to get people to engage with the capitalist system and expand it, promote it. And um, perhaps um, socialism, uh, building socialism so far, hasn't been sufficiently coercively efficient in giving people incentives to engage. So one sort of jokey subtitle for, for this talk could have been how to build socialism by getting 7.5% interest rate. <laughs> um, obviously, that's not you can't do that yet, but that's the kind of shape of thing that I'm groping towards where it's, it's, it's a bloody good thing we want to achieve politically. And it makes our lives better immediately at the expense of the capitalist sector, um, what have you. So um, it's true that the state, with enough uh, will and power, can break things. Um, it can shut hardware down. The Secret Service can kick in your door and take your keys from you, take your computer from you. They can turn off the, the internet in places. And um, that's all true, but it's, not, it's true now, even without blockchain stuff. So the, the idea is that the blockchain stuff will make it harder, not, not prevent it entirely, it'll make it much, much, much harder. And one of the interesting things about Ethereum is that from the get-go, and even today, and I do admire some of the founders for this, is that they're explicitly designing Ethereum and building it to be a robust to a nation-state ad adversary. And um, one of the ways they're trying to achieve that is by making the network highly decentralized such that anyone with an ordinary computer can participate in the network. So I don't know how many nodes there are on Ethereum right now, but I think it's on the order of hundreds of thousands. Um, probably over half a million, actually. Um, distributed all around the world. Obviously, mo lots in America, lots in Europe, in the rich countries, but also in Africa, in lots of places. As long as the internet's still going, and it survives the nuclear attack or the shutdown of large parts of it and it reroutes the communications, as long as there's some <coughs> nodes still up and running, Ethereum is still up and running. Um, now, it, that's... How robust is that? Who knows? But that's the aim, is to try and make it as robust as possible. And, um, yes, the state could uh, kick down your door and take your keys, but if there's lots of keys shared along, along a collective of people and they can be hidden, then that's got to be better than um, having a bank account with um, HSBC. Um, yeah, I'll stop, I'll stop there. Thank you very much again. Next week, the analyst.